Tonight, game on. Trump knows Haley's the only one who can beat him. The clearest evidence yet of Nikki Haley's meteoric rise. New Hampshire can't afford Nikki high tax Haley. Made in China. We continue uh, to encourage the Chinese to use that influence. And with the U.S. Navy in Iran's sights, the Biden administration turns to Beijing for help. Is that really the plan? Happy New Year. New documents could reveal 170 of Jeffrey Epstein's best friends. Why did the rich and famous cavort with a convicted sex predator? And no chicken for you. The politician who wants to cut America's favorite chicken shack out of highway rest stops unless they open on Sunday. Welcome to the Ferris Show on television. First tonight, Nikki Haley's new nickname and why President Trump's supporters are so concerned that she might be vice president. We've told you for a week, this is her moment. And you can't really have a moment in Republican politics in the past, say, 10 years without a nickname from Donald Trump. Nikki Haley promised. I will not, not now, not ever, support raising the gas tax. Just 24 months later, high tax Haley flipped. Let's increase the gas tax by 10 cents. New Hampshire can't afford Nikki high tax Haley. To be fair, it was Trump's super PAC that released the ad. Campaigns aren't supposed to coordinate, but they do find amazing ways to talk to the super PAC anyway. High tax Haley sounds a lot like a Trump nickname floated perhaps over the weekend at Mar-a-Lago. There could have been a dinner where someone from the super PAC just happened to overhear Donald Trump mention high tax Haley. And this weekend would have been a time that Nikki Haley would have been a subject to conversation. CBS released a poll showing her only 15 points behind Trump. The poll included a lot of independents who can vote in New Hampshire's open primary. Who knows? Trump attacking Haley in New Hampshire might actually help her with independent and moderate Democrats who can vote in the open primary. In response to the new ad, she said on X two days ago, Donald Trump denied our surge in New Hampshire existed. Now he's running a negative ad against me. Somebody's getting nervous. Hashtag bring it. But the attacks on Haley aren't only about her running for president, the far right, mega MAGA, Tucker Carlson wing of the Republican Party, whatever you want to call them. They're nervous about Haley, too. But that's because they fear, and it appears to be a genuine fear, that Trump might pick her as vice president. Would you vote for Trump if he chose Nikki as VP? And I- would you guys vote no? for Trump? I well, mean, that's the question that I asked you specifically. Well, I, right. I, I, I would not only not vote for that ticket, I would, I would advocate against it as strongly as I could. Here's someone who's actively opposed to the interests of the country I grew up in, it is a creature of the oligarchs. Creature of the oligarch. Tucker really never lets facts get in the way of a good attack. But Tucker never punches down, at least publicly. The fact that he's attacking Nikki Haley tells you something. The attacks show Haley's meteoric rise in New Hampshire makes him and like-minded folks worried. Lauren Wright, professor of political science at Princeton University, is with us. But first, former Trump campaign manager Corey Lewandowski. Corey, it's always good to see you. I appreciate it. Uh, Let's start with this. I'm fascinated, but I cannot figure out why Nikki Haley is so triggering, threatening, what's the right adjective, to the Tucker Carlson wing of the Republican and a very important part of the Republican primary electorate? Well, Leland, I think if you look at Nikki Haley's record, clearly, uh, and you look at the ad that the Super PAC put out, she said she wouldn't support a gas tax, only to step back two years later and support that gas tax. I remember vividly when she was contemplating running for president, when she called Donald Trump and said, if you run for president again, I will not run. So the concern I think that Tucker and many of us have is that you can't believe what comes out of Nikki Haley's mouth. What we're seeing now is most members of the mainstream media are advocating for her to have this surge, this massive push. We know she's not going to win in Iowa, but her ability to do well here in my home state of New Hampshire is probably because of the fact that, as you mentioned, independents can vote in the open primary system. What most people don't know 
is that Joe Biden is not actually on the ballot in New Hampshire. So there's an active write in campaign to get the Democrats and some of those moderates to support Joe Biden so he's not embarrassed in the first in the nation primary. All right. Help me just to pull on this thread with Nikki Haley. If if Trump is the figure that his supporters say he is, who always picks the right people, who gets it right, on and on and on, and he would be picking the vice presidential candidate, and Nikki Haley's so terrible, why would anybody be worried that he would pick somebody that's so bad and they spend so much time right now worried about it? Well, Leland, look, I have the unique position of being the individual who's the chairman of the vice presidential selection committee eight years ago. I was there when we vetted Mike Pence and came down to the final three candidates and brought those individuals to Donald Trump, who ultimately decided to pick Mike Pence to be his VP, who was a great VP for three years, 355 days or so. So until the last 10 days, he was phenomenal. Now look, the problem we have with Nikki Haley is she is influenced by individuals who are in the Trump orbit, who liked the work that she did in the globalist market, who liked her as a United Nations uh, ambassador. But when you go talk to those true Trump supporters, the Henry McMasters of the world, the current governor of South Carolina, you look at the support that Donald Trump has in the state of South Carolina, Nikki's home state, every elected official in that state statewide is supporting Donald Trump because they know Nikki Haley the best. And if you can't oh, win yeah, your home no, state, look, Haley's, Haley's, up, Haley's down 30 points in, in the last poll in South Carolina. We don't have anything new, but uh, the, the point's well made. Corey, how much, and your, your home state is New Hampshire, you know the electorate there well. How much does a tax by Donald Trump on Nikki Haley, is, how much is the Trump super PAC taking Haley seriously, actually help Nikki Haley with anti-Trump independence in that, that sort of maverick streak that New Hampshire has? Well, look, I, I think if you look at what the super PAC did to Ron DeSantis, they destroyed his career probably before he ever got in the race and he's never recovered. You know, by and large, people have avoided engaging with Nikki Haley until the super PAC ad is out. The reason is the latest poll shows that Nikki Haley is within 15 points of Donald Trump. No candidate has been within 15 points of Donald Trump in any race, in any place, since June of this year when Ron DeSantis had a small surge in Iowa. So this is real. We've seen Chris Sununu endorse Nikki Haley. We know that the establishment money is going to be behind Nikki Haley. I believe Ron DeSantis gets out of this race after Iowa. His support is behind Nikki Haley, and that will allow her to be competitive here in New Hampshire. She's not going to win, but she's going to be competitive, and that will allow her to stay in the race, probably through South Carolina. Well, certainly if she if she places and does well in, in New Hampshire, you'd have to imagine she's going to stick around at least through South Carolina, because who knows what happens. Speaking of who knows what happens, the Colorado Supreme Court ruled that Donald Trump is disqualified from the 2024 election. This is in the past hour or so, uh, because he supported, in their words, an insurrection. In, in, they said the 14th Amendment of the Constitution, which bars someone who has conducted an insurrection and been involved in an insurrection from running uh, for president. This goes to the U.S. Supreme Court. Your prediction. Look, the U.S. Supreme Court has to take this up immediately. The Colorado Supreme Court has put their decision on hold until January 4th to give the U.S. Supreme Court time. But what's amazing to me, Leland, here is Donald Trump has never been charged yeah. with an insurrection. He's never been on trial. He's never been even accused by Jack Smith, someone who has all of the resources of the federal government to go after Donald Trump. He's never been accused, charged or convicted of this. So for the Supreme Court to rule in a 4-3 decision that Donald Trump is ineligible to be on the Colorado ballot only is going to drive this issue further and, and once again outline the two-tier justice system. Because if you've never been convicted of this crime, how can the state Supreme Court say you're ineligible to be on the ballot for president of the United States? Let the people decide. Yeah, I, I, can't, I, I, can't, I can't figure out how a court rules that someone is guilty of a crime that they haven't been charged with because insurrection is a crime and rebellions a crime uh, in the United States, and then saying you engage in this behavior without due process. So anyway, we'll, we'll see what the Supreme Court says, but I, your analysis seems to, to make sense. Um, I, I think, though, back, back to Nikki Haley um, and what, what she's saying and why it's interesting, at least to cer a certain part of the Republican Party, uh, sought uh, Haley not ruling out being a vice presidential candidate. Take a listen. Are you going to rule it out? I don't play for a second. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. It's offensive when anybody says that, oh, you know, she wants to be vice president. But you're not going to rule it out because you're not going to rule it out. I mean, it's not even a conversation.
Everybody says it's not a conversation until it is. Look, you were part of the search committee for Mike Pence. Mike Pence, a devout Christian, evangelical, didn't really align with Donald Trump on a lot of things, certainly didn't align on faith, uh, certainly didn't align on, on his net worth, which something is something that Donald Trump was reportedly not too impressed with when it came to Mike Pence. But he provided a reassurance to an important part of the electorate, which was evangelical Christians, which he turned out one of the reasons, if not the reason, Trump won. As we look at the Make America Great Again rally, Waterloo, Iowa, as Trump is rallying again, uh, if, if polling shows that somebody like Nikki Haley or Nikki Haley is the person to bring along independents and suburban women who don't necessarily like uh, the mean tweets and Donald Trump's style, but want to change, and she provides the reassurance uh, come, come, you know, come July that they need to vote for Trump in the general election, you don't think he'd pick her or somebody like her? Look, Leela, he could pick somebody like her, and I would be I'd be open to that. Look, I think Joni Ernst is a very serious candidate. Elise Stefanik is a serious candidate. Christy Noem is a serious candidate. Tim mm-hmm. Scott, a serious candidate. They all bring their pros and cons to a presidential ticket. Nikki Haley right now is the flavor of the month. She's a flavor du jour. She's the one that everyone's saying, hey, maybe you should pick. Look, when you have two individuals who are running against each other, that have an adversarial relationship, that doesn't work or doesn't work very often in an administration. And we know Donald Trump, when he gets elected, has four years. You go pick a a, a Christy Noem, an Elise Stefanik, a a Joni Ernst, a Tim Scott, someone like that, they can carry that MAGA torch forward Mm -hmm. and they are willing to be Donald Trump's partner and not someone who's trying to outshine them for their own benefit. And I think that's that's what you want to talk about. You want to talk about sort of the ultimate vice president in in a sense. It was Mike Pence who never tried to outshine uh, Donald Trump. So the the pick there was successful. Corey, it's good to see you as always. Thank you. Lauren Wright, associate research scholar, lecturer in politics and public affairs, Princeton University. Lauren, you and I have done television for a long time together. Okay, and the number of times you and I have talked about somebody having their moment against Donald Trump in Republican mm-hmm. politics, I need my hands, I need my feet to all <laughs> right, count on, right. and yet it's never happened. Right, and so, you know, this is always going to be a very annoying bone I pick with you, but uh-huh. when we say Trump attacking Haley might help her. It's essentially causal. You're saying that had he not attacked her, she might be doing worse. I don't think that's true. I think she's been on the rise for a while. I think the rise is cumulative. I think it's performance-based. She's done very well lately, and people are paying attention. So I don't agree with that part. I do take Corey's point, though, that these are two different groups of voters. There is not very much overlap among them, although the Haley supporters hate Trump much more than the Trump supporters hate Haley. They're actually just more apathetic about her. And, and interesting, and I think that may be one of the reasons that you have sort of the ultra-Trumpers, if you want to call that the Tucker Carlson, sure. thing, attacking her so hard because they, they worry about the Trump agnostic, Trump squishy folks who may go over to Nikki Haley. And interestingly enough, she is trying in a, in a real way to appeal to them Uh, taking on John Carl of ABC. Take a listen. Why is Donald Trump only attacking Nikki Haley? Because Trump knows Haley's the only one who can beat him. Want an 80-year-old name from the past or a new generation of conservative leadership? All right, so that was Nikki Haley's response ad uh, to Trump attacks. Can you out-attack Trump? Probably not. I mean, that's what he's best at. That's why voters love him in the first place. But she's probably smart not to alienate those voters. I don't think she's going to win. I think it's sort of an outlier possibility. I think what she's done is impressive. But what's really interesting is if you look at the polling, when we ask people, who's your second choice? What are the alternatives? Among Trump supporters, if we ask if you're satisfied or dissatisfied, if Haley's ultimately the nominee, it's about 40%, 40%. If you ask Haley supporters if they're upset if Trump's the nominee, it's 70 percent are dissatisfied. And so she's really trying to keep both coalitions happy. There just aren't that many people in this mix. And the elites that you're talking about are different than the voters who will cast their ballot. Yeah, both the elites within Haley world are different yes. than Haley voters and the elites within yes. Trump world are different than the voters there. Yeah. Always good to see yeah, you. Yeah, good Thank to see you. Thank you very much. Pirates of the Caribbean made famous the saying, dead men tell no tales. Certainly a sense of comfort for some of Jeffrey Epstein's friends and associates who flew on his plane. Here we have Jeffrey Epstein, the pirate. A number of his friends, his associates, who hung out 
with Jeffrey Epstein and his harem of women, often underage women. Those associates who paid him millions to manage their money. Well, the dead man may now tell tales. Epstein will speak next year from the grave, or at least his documents will. A judge ruled a sealed list of 177 Epstein contacts will be made public at the start of the new year. The Daily Mail scooped this earlier today. Many of these are people who hung out with Epstein, paid him vast sums of money, all while knowing he preyed on underage girls. We're not saying they did. We're saying they knew about it and still hung out with him. Lex Wexner of Victoria's Secret paid Epstein $50 million for financial advice. Gave him a $13 million townhouse in the Upper West Side of Manhattan in 2011. There's Leon Black, a billionaire hedge fund who paid Epstein hundreds of millions of dollars for financial advice. No one really understood why, when a lawsuit accusing Black of raping a girl at Epstein's house in the early 2000s came out, people started to draw their own conclusions. Black's never been charged or convicted of any crime. Epstein's former lawyer, Alan Dershowitz, came on our show back in May to talk about all of these people who still, despite some very, very questionable behavior by Epstein, some repugnant behavior by Epstein, still cavorted with Epstein. I think he had some extortion over some people. I think some people may have uh, come to him, not for his great set, uh, financial advice. I never thought he was that good. Uh, financially. I never took financial advice uh, from him. Um, and, and, and I suspect there were, there were people over whom he had something involving uh, the sex stuff. Of course, there were some very famous people who hung out with Jeffrey Epstein, Prince Andrew, Bill Clinton, Donald Trump, Bill Gates. Now we'll get the names of 177 more and possibly why they spent so much time with him. There's new allegations leveled against Harvard's president, Claudine Gay. A whistleblower says she's committed an additional 40 instances of plagiarism. This would call nearly two-thirds of her scholarly output into question. And remember, Harvard allegedly had an exhaustive review of all of her work and cleared her of any wrongdoing. These new allegations come with, shall we say, receipts. We'll have the receipts tomorrow night right here on Balance. Next. Speak softly and ask Beijing for help. The Biden administration reveals their new plan for protecting U.S. troops in the Middle East. Does it have a chance to protect American troops? And the Biden White House says the president's real problem is too rigorous a schedule. George Will on solving the age problem by having the president do less. I will not make age an issue of this campaign. I am not going to exploit for political purposes my opponent's youth and inexperience. <laughs> we continue uh, to encourage the Chinese to use that influence, use those conversations uh, to lean on the Supreme Leader and Iran to stop their support for the Houthis. It's National Security Council spokesman John Kirby explaining the White House's latest attempt to bring Iran into line. As you heard, we're asking for China's help. But the Iranian militias haven't gotten the message, or at least maybe China hasn't delivered it, to be fair. Today, those Iranian militias released their own Top Gun-esque hype video. All right, yes, those are Vietnam-era fighter planes flown out of Iranian groups in Yemen, They're no match, of course, for the U.S. Navy, but they could do real damage to cargo ships and others in the Red Sea. It's a threat to American lives, but already the price of oil because of Iranian attacks is up 10 percent. So stay tuned tuned for gas prices next week. The U.S. Navy is going to lead an international task force to reopen the shipping lanes after nearly 40 attacks. Ten percent of the world's traffic goes by Yemen, where the militias spent the past few weeks taking pot shots using very cheap drones. We're already outspending Iran to protect these ships 60 to 1. It costs approximately $20,000 for one Iranian-made drone and up to $2.1 million per U.S. missile to shoot the drone down. That's, of course, if we only use one missile per drone. Oftentimes, we fire more. Iran likes the math and the odds. Well, Ed Ferris is here, foreign policy expert and author of Iran, an imperialist republic and U.S. policy, retired Navy SEAL officer Mike Sorelli. Gentlemen, it is good to see you both. Waleed, uh, in an imperialist republic of Iran, they, Iran sees the math. They hear mm-hmm. 
they hear John Kirby today at the White House, what do they think? Well, first of all, they get the cash. Have we forgotten, Leland, that they have been getting those billions of dollars? That's where the money is coming from for them to buy even those old planes that they had from before and missiles, ballistic missiles. These are the missiles that uh, the Houthis are using. The Iranian regime believe and feel that as long as the Biden administration is, in fact, negotiating with them and sending money, they believe that we are not going to take any action against them. We're going to rely on China. You were just mentioning China. We're going to rely on other uh, you know, powers to negotiate. The Iranians have a plan, and the administration doesn't at this point in time, and that's my concern. Mike, in terms of right now what's happening in the Gulf of Aden and in the Red Sea, and it matters to, to us here at home just in terms of gas prices and everything else, Right now, we're just being defensive, right? We're using anti-aircraft missiles to shoot down these drones. How long would it take, realistically, to take out the Houthis' launch facilities, take out their weapon storage facilities, and free the, the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden of, of that threat? Well, Leland, first, that video the Houthis produced wouldn't be cool in 1986. So they are completely uh, off base there. You hit the nail on the head. The multinational task force is great, but it's on the defense. It doesn't take long for any offense to find a way through. Unless we strike the Houthi strike capabilities and eliminate those, this is going to be a consistent problem. And not only the oil prices, as you just mentioned, $10 billion worth of cargo goes through the Suez Canal. Insurance prices for the maritime industry will go up, and this is going to impact the global economy across the uh, board. No, it certainly will. We've seen that before. Waleed, uh, this is some of uh, where the attacks have taken place by the Iranians. What is the Iranians' goal here, right? Because if they wanted to actually cause more damage, they, they could do it. They could start a war with the United States and do enough that we would absolutely have to respond. There'd just be too much public pressure. But they're not backing down either. I I'm wondering if they're not getting exactly what they want here, if you can describe what that is. As chess players, basically, they know very well if they do a direct attack a la Pearl Harbor against United States direct interest or citizens, we will have to. I mean, despite all the Iran deal and the negotiations and what have you, we will have to respond, and they know that. So they are using their arms, their militias. And what they're trying to do every day, I'm going to link it to somewhere far in the north. The more the Israelis are dismantling Hamas and moving south towards the border with Egypt, the more the Iranian regime, who do not want to lose this major militia that they fund in Gaza, they are telling the United States and the international uh, community that if you don't stop Israel and get a ceasefire, that's their slogan, then we, we're going to cut off your world economy with our militias. You're not going to see us and our flags, but you'll, you'll, you'll find the Houthis. And we know that you don't want to open fire on the Houthis because there will be a new war and you are in election year. And therefore, that's what the Iranians want to do, convince us to pressure the Israelis to stop their attack on Hamas. That's the goal. Well, we're, we're going to we're gonna get to that a little later, um, actually, that exact issue of whether and how Iran's doing that. But, Mike, just give us ground truth. Uh, last, last few sentences in terms of how long it would take if the, the Navy was giving a, given a hunting license with no bag limit to eliminate the Houthi threat. Hours and days. Don't discount our troops. They're lethal when they need to be. And especially with F-18s and our aircraft carriers, they can minimize this threat in a matter of hours to days. Yeah, it's just it's about what the policy is. All right. Gentlemen, thank you very much. We appreciate it. Uh, speaking of President Biden, some of President Biden's aides think his real problem is that he does too much. His approval rating right now is around freezing. And aside from the economy, most people who are polled think he's too old. In fact, he now has a lower approval rating than his number two. Alex Thompson at Axios reports current and former Biden aides say he often pushes to do more travel and events than they think he should. Biden pushing up against his limits sometimes creates a cycle in which he wears himself out and then appears fatigued during public events. The White House's problem isn't that Biden appears to be worn out. It's that there's nothing left, and this is just to be fair, there's nothing left to do about it. Putting nap time on the official White House schedule won't help things. Among the changes the White House has already made for President Biden, he uses the mini stairs on Air Force One to avoid a fall. His events are mostly from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. every day. He rarely does more than one or at times two events a day. If you look closely, 
He wears sneakers rather than standard dress shoes. We're told that's because they want to avoid any chance of him falling. He skipped a public birthday celebration. George Will, News Nation senior contributor, is with us. George, it is good to see you. We're sorry it's not in person, but uh, good to have you here uh, anyway. Is seeing less of President Biden an answer? No, because hiding him makes him, and this is a paradox, the more he's hidden, the more conspicuous the issue becomes. The fact is, Leland, that his polls are terrible and they are actually worse than they seem. Let me give you two examples. In order to win the Electoral College, a Democrat has to win the popular vote by 2 to 4 percent because the Democrats have lots of wasted votes in the sense that they carry California by 5 million votes, but that doesn't get them any more electoral votes than if they carried it by one vote. The same is true in New York and Illinois. Second, if Mr. Biden carries the African-American vote by, say, 70 percent, people say, gee, that's a landslide. If he carries the African-American vote by 70 percent, he loses because he is, and most Democrats recently have been accustomed to, carrying the African-American vote by something in the 90s. So his position is really perilous at this point. And you think about where the African-American vote is key. It's going to be Michigan, Pennsylvania, Georgia, North Carolina. These are these are the major major swing states. The other thing that President Biden has been reported to try and do, and we've seen this publicly, right? He doesn't do a lot of press conferences. Uh, Last solo press conference, November 15th. Last one before that was September 15th. But he has now started to make his own jokes about the age issue. Take a listen. I just want you to know it's difficult turning 60. This is the 76th anniversary of this event. And I want you to know I wasn't there in the first one. (laughs) I was too young to make it up. (laughs) All right. You compare those to what Ronald Reagan did uh, in the 1984 debate, his joke about his age. Take a listen. I will not make age an issue of this campaign. I am not going to exploit for political purposes my opponent's youth and inexperience. (laughs) Similar jokes. Uh. Why is it that it worked for Ronald Reagan, did not work, and does not work for Joe Biden? First of all, Ronald Reagan was 10 years younger, approximately, than Joe Biden is. Second, Ronald Reagan exuded a kind of vigor and vigorous campaigning that Mr. Biden is going to obviously avoid. Uh, Furthermore, the American people have made up their mind about Biden. Uh, Look, Leland... If you're running for president and they don't like your policies, change your policies. If they don't like your ads, change your ads. If they don't like your age, what are you going to do? The fact is he cannot disguise the fact that he is one stumble, one stumble walking across the manicured White House lawn, one stumble from being out of this campaign. Hmm. That's a very perilous position. Yeah, the world's I, oldest political party. I, I think about the reporting from Axios, Alex Thompson, saying that Jill Biden, uh, the first lady, is intimately involved in his scheduling, intimately involved in all of these discussions. Her staff is um, as well. I know you were a big Woodrow Wilson fan, but at the, the tail end of the Wilson administration, it was his wife who was effectively running things. And I'm wondering if the White House doesn't worry, right, that the less President Biden is seen, the more those questions uh, following up on Alex's reporting are going to start getting asked about really how in charge he is, how much of this is a Biden presidency versus a figurehead with a a prime minister uh, behind him. That's one problem, but there's an opposite nature of that problem, and it is this. Joe Biden says, I'll just get out there and show people how vigorous I am. Ron DeSantis said... Wait till I get out and start campaigning after the Florida legislature goes out. He came out, people looked at him, and they didn't like it, and he began to go straight down in the polls. It's quite possible that the more Biden is exposed to the public, the more the public's preconceptions will become firm conceptions.
Yeah, as, as we said, uh, the problem isn't his age. The problem is there's not much much left to do about it. George, um, it is good to see you. Uh, we're getting all of our smartest minds, you being at the top of that list, on the following question. Um, yes or no, November of 2024, will Trump be the Republican nominee and Joe Biden be the Democratic nominee? To the latter, definitely no. I think Mr. Biden will not be nominated. And uh, I'm... If I, 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 I'd bet 51-49 against Trump at this point. Excellent. Thank you, sir. The tape, the tape is marked. We're looking forward to next year. We won't talk before Christmas. Merry, Merry Christmas to you and yours. And to you. All right, thanks. Coming up next, the director of one of Gaza's biggest hospitals admits he's actually a leader of Hamas. Will this new revelation do anything to change most young Americans' opinions on who Israel is fighting against? What's your current position? Manager of the hospital. Manager of Kamal Adnan Hospital. When did you join Hamas? 2010. When was the last time you did military training? 2010. What's your rank in Hamas? Brigadier General. All right, so you just heard from the head of a hospital in Gaza who also happens to be a general in Hamas pretty much clears up the question about whether Hamas used hospitals. Of course, you won't hear about this new reporting from the New York Times or MSNBC. That was video released by the Israelis after they captured that Hamas general. And a lot of the media has given up talking about the Palestinian civilian deaths, too. They are undoubtedly tragic, but fair people now blame Hamas, not Israel. So now the anti-Israel types have a new line of attack. What happens after the war? The Washington Post headlines with an editorial, there will be a day after in Gaza. Here's what it can look like. NPR, disagreements emerge over who should be in control of Gaza when the war ends. Voice of America, U.S. Middle East vision emerges as Biden focuses beyond Gaza war. Nobody talked about the Marshall Plan or how to rebuild Europe during D-Day or the Battle of the Bulge. Yet, here is President Biden. And when this crisis is over, there has to be a vision of what comes next. And in our view, it has to be a two-state solution. Hmm. It's curious that the president and much of the media hold on to a plan for Gaza and for the Palestinians, meaning both Gaza and the West Bank, that the Palestinians themselves say they don't want. 72% are not supportive of a two-state solution. That number is higher among younger Palestinians. This, as Hamas time and time again, promises repeats of October 7th. In fact, 75% of all Palestinians support the October 7th attack. Here's Bill Maher from Friday explaining the hurdles to ending the Gaza war with negotiation. What's happening to Palestinians today is horrible, and not just in Gaza, in the West Bank, too. But wars end with negotiation, and what the media glosses over is It's hard to negotiate when the other side's bargaining position is you all die and disappear. With us now, Zach Sarr, Deputy Counsel General for Israel in New York. It's good to see you. Thank you. I know I don't know the last day you got a day off or some sleep, but thank you. (laughs) Help us understand, why do you think there is so much focus on the day after a war that still has a long way to go? Well, we do have a long way to go. And, uh, of course, we need to think about the day after. But currently we're focusing on making sure that we um, eliminate Hamas's abilities, capabilities, and also mm-hmm. will to ever commit atrocities uh, like October 7th. Uh, I can assure you two things. One is that Hamas will be, their capabilities will be eliminated. And the second thing is that Israel will not be there. We don't want to be in the Gaza Strip in the day after. Of course, we have to talk to our uh, uh, partners in the region, uh, and around the world on how exactly we'll do it, but we currently focus on... Well, to goal. be fair, Israel unilaterally withdrew from Gaza, which right. your prime minister sort of alluded to be to have become Hamasistan, uh, in the words of Bibi Netanyahu. But is it time to give up on this concept of a two-state solution and realize that something else has to be there? Well, I think the two-state solution is still something that um, is a goal, but we need to see how we get there. And how we get there while making sure there is no threat on Israel. We cannot go back to 6th of October. This uh, is out of question. 
Okay, but you say how to get there, right? And Bibi Netanyahu said he is proud. Publicly, he said he's proud that he prevented a Palestinian state meeting in the West Bank where there would have been similar kinds of attacks possibly coming out of. But you keep saying how to get to a two-state solution. How do you get to a two-state solution when 72% of Palestinians don't support a two-state solution? Why hold on to this goal? Well, first of all, you know, it's, it's, it's very difficult, you know, and we would like to have peace. And after what happened on 7th of October, we need to make sure that we eliminate not only the, uh, the capabilities, but also the will for violence. Unfortunately, with Hamas, it's impossible because it's in their charter. They call again and again and again for, like they say, that they would... Right, but if 72% if of Palestinians don't support a, a two-state solution, can you eliminate the desire for violence by those 72% of people or those 75% that support October 7th by more violence? Not by more violence, but we need to make sure that uh, these areas are demilitarized so they cannot pose a threat. And then we need to have hope. and We need to work with our partners to make sure that there's security and then we can have hope. Security both for Palestinians and Israelis. And then we can have hope. And then we can think about two-state solution and how to realize that. I think there was a president here who once had hope as a policy. It didn't work out too well, but we'll see. Sir, it's good to see you. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. We appreciate Thank the time. Much. We invite you to sign up for War Notes. That gives you a free look at the show every day at 4 p.m. Go to warnotes.com and subscribe. The notes started as our internal email discussion about the most important events of the day. It's literally how we put the show together. You get to be a part of it. You can respond to the email with your thoughts. You can also join us on social media at Leland Vittert on Instagram or Twitter. That's warnotes.com and subscribe for free. Live pictures of President Trump on the stump in Iowa. We're going to check in and see what he has to say about the Colorado Supreme Court banning him from the ballot in Colorado. He lost the state of Colorado, but could he be banned from the ballots in other states? That fight when we come back. All right, live pictures. President Trump, Waterloo, Iowa. In the past couple of hours, we have learned Mr. Trump, at least as things stand right now, will not be on the ballot in Colorado. The state Supreme Court removed him for violating Colorado's insurrection clause. That is the the insurrection clause in the U.S. Constitution, uh, that if you were involved in insurrection, you cannot be on the ballot. Chris is here. Look, you're many things. You're a host. You are an attorney. And evidently, you are also a prophet because you did a podcast on this a couple of months ago and said, look, the 14th Amendment, the issue in all these suits and all these states to get Trump off the ballot is going to be an issue. I think everybody is maybe not surprised that a state Supreme Court would do this as as a political move. I guess the question is the political move backfire. I think you have to separate law and politics, even though it's easy for them to become conflated. And we're certainly seeing that uh, when it comes to former President Trump. But I don't think that this works out the way the Colorado Supreme Court is saying. It really smacks of Bush v. Gore, uh, where the Supreme Court, especially with its current composition, is very likely to say this is a political question. This is not for us to settle. And they'll say, but wait, it's right there in Section 3. That was done during Reconstruction to deal with people who had been part of the Confederacy. Uh, The president's not mentioned. We don't know if it's self-executing. The Supreme Court... Uh, overturned, which is their right, the district court, which had said this doesn't apply. And then they just made a finding of fact on their own that not only did he incite it, but he wanted he wanted Pence to not uh, fulfill his constitutional duty. So he's guilty of insurrection. So he is disqualified. Insur- insurrection, though, is a crime, right? I mean, there is, there is crimes that you can commit. It is now. Right. So how does a court, though, how do you, you want to get down to the very basics of due process? How does a court say that this person... Donald Trump committed a crime for which he's not been charged with. Jack Smith didn't charge him with insurrection or any of these crimes related. And then says not only is he not been charged with it, but he is now guilty of it without the ability to provide a defense or call witnesses in your own defense or any of the other provisions in provided for you. Quick two-part answer. First, Jack Smith, I do not believe, is going to go back and charge him with this now, right. by the way. So I don't think that's going to happen. Um, second, the tricky thing is the, the answer should be they can't. That's not how it works. However, in this one provision, 
it doesn't deal with the crime of insurrection. It's talking about activity that had been the Civil War. Right. They did not foresee it being used this way. And I think it's going to be litigated. And I think that the Supreme Court, especially in its current composition, is going to say, let the people decide, put them on. Because it's not like impeachment. Impeachment's done. Disqualification can be appealed in court. And that's what he's going to do. All right. You got this, all this next hour, right? Yep. All right, we'll see you at the top of the hour. Coming up next, this is a problem you, you want to hear about. A New York City politician has finally found a problem he can solve. There's a new bill that would require Chick-fil-A to open on Sunday. Chris could finally get waffle fries seven days a week. Will he when it comes back? I'm 30% waffle fries. Really? 30% I'm of my body I'm 15% nuggets. <laughs> New York State Assemblyman Tony Simone, seen right there, says he can finally solve a real problem here in the Big Apple, hunger. Not hunger among the poor and homeless, but hunger among folks driving on New York's highways and tollways. He just proposed a bill requiring Chick-fil-A's inside the state's toll road rest stops to stay open on Sunday. Since it started, the company keeps its stores closed on Sunday to allow its employees to get a day of rest and honor their religious observances. Here now, Republican New York State Assembly member Matt Slater, who opposes the plan. Uh, we asked Tony. He declined. But, man, I'm kind of torn on this because I would actually really love waffle fries on a Sunday. But at the same time, I'm not sure how you get around dictating somebody their religious observances. I, I mean, listen, this is just patently ridiculous. And when you look at all the issues that New York is facing— this misses the mark by a country mile. You know, we are, uh, we, New York is facing the worst economic outlook in the entire country. And it's just baffling to me that my colleagues would propose a bill that is not only so anti-business, but clearly anti-religious. Uh, and really, like I said, the fact that we're wasting time here when we're dealing with a migrant crisis, an affordability crisis, and the worst economic outlook in the nation is really embarrassing, I think, uh, as a legislative body. Well, I mean, I guess it gives you an excuse for not dealing with all the all the real problems. Uh, all right. Uh, I got I got 15 seconds. Is it going to pass? I sure hope not. I mean, again, we have so many issues that we're facing a multi-billion dollar budget deficit. And let's be clear. The rest stops in New York state, they're required to provide 24 hour hot and cold options. So this is not going to stop anyone from eating when they go through the drive through or they're going through the, the rest stop over on, along the thruway here in New York state. This is just ridiculous. It is a waste of time and really sends the wrong message uh, when it comes to New York's economic outlook. All right. Uh, we'll, we'll check back in on it. Obviously, Tony's welcome anytime. Good to see you, Matt. Thank you very much. Uh, Donald Trump still on the stump in Iowa. Will he be on the ballot in Colorado? Chris has more. <laughs> 